Well, good morning, everybody. Hi. Morning. Got a few sleepy heads out there. That's okay. Let's wake up for God. I try to. <laughs> Praise the Lord forever. Um, been a tough week. And, you know, we just got a little bit more to go. Let's just uh, trust in God. He's going to get us through all this way. We want to go to prayer uh, first thing this morning. Uh, Reverend Jerome, would you pray for us, please? It was a wonderful lesson this morning. I got a lot out of it. You guys missed it. should have been here. It was great. Heavenly Father, we thank thee, Lord. Yes. We thank you for this Lord's day. And we thank you for each and every soul present, Lord. And, Father, from the Sunday school lesson, Lord, we've... I've learned, Lord, that partial obedience is disobedience, Lord. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will bless and touch each and every one of us, Lord, to enable and empower us, Lord, to be obedient servants, Lord, having us to be able to trust in you and to, and to just stand on your promises, Lord, and just stand on your faithfulness, Lord. And you have been very faithful to each and every one of us, Lord. And we're so grateful and thankful for that, Lord. And you've brought us, Lord, to this morning's service, Lord. We're asking for thy help, for thy leadership, and for thy guidance this morning, Lord. Touch the ears and touch the hearts of each and every one of us, Lord. Bless your blessed servant this morning, Lord. Strengthen and empower him, Lord, to bring forth, Lord, what you've laid upon his heart, Lord. And Lord, continue to look over this campus, Lord. Continue to bless it, protect it, Lord. And for all that you do this morning, we give thee the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, it's time for a couple of songs out of our hymnal. Let's raise up our voice to the Lord. And at the same time, let's raise our hands, at least in our heart or in our souls. Okay, let's go and have a couple of songs now to praise the Lord. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Let's turn to page 357.
I like that song, and I am happy since my burgers rolled away. I was really worried about a lot of things just a year ago, a year and a half ago. I didn't know exactly what was going to happen every day whenever I was coming across the United States. A lot of times late sleeping on the ground and, you know, bugs and crazy people walking around, just me in a sleeping bag and a guitar and a Bible. But whenever those fears would happen, I'd pull out the Bible and read it, and it would calm me down. Uh, I think that's what it's talking about there when my burdens rolled away. I just trusted in where I was going to go and made it step by step, place to place. It's funny how I don't remember all of those places where I stayed at, but uh, I do remember because I didn't read at night in the light, I would read and go to sleep just at dark, but I would read at night. I just destroyed my Bible on the way. But I absorbed the words, and those burdens, they rolled away, and I finally made it here. And it took about uh, five months <laughs> to get here, but the fears were not that bad, and I knew everything was going to be fine once I got here, and it was, praise God. He brought me here for a reason, and it wasn't anything special or anything to do with a lot of people. I think it was just to do with me. I don't know if in this lifetime I'm supposed to do very much, but I know in the next one, I think I got a big job. So that's what I'm here preparing for. We want to, I want to pray for whatever God wants to happen to me to happen. Uh, I know it will, but I want it to go exactly the way that he wants, and I'll follow his steps. So I, that's my prayer. It's just a day-by-day -day prayer. And when you guys ask for prayers, you don't have to ask for something that's like way out there in the future or pray to God. Remember when we ask, the first thing we want to do is understand that we're talking to God. And there is a God, and he is listening. And so that's what prayers are all about. Little prayers are important because those are little steps. Big prayers are important because those are big steps. But he knows about all those steps and they're already in control. He just wants to hear our voice and our, our praise and our worship. And that's what prayer is about. It's talking, touching base with God. Jesus was a human. He was a man. And he lives. He is God. And he's the one that understands and is our mediator and our translator for God. And our prayers are important and we want to hear them. And he wants to hear them, even though he knows they're already there. Does anybody have any prayers this morning? Uh, yes, Jody. We want to, uh, uh, Brother Doug's uh, our friend Jordan. Uh, Jordan, they used to come to, to church. Uh, Doug uh, texted me the other day. Us to, to keep Jordan in prayer. Let's also remember Sister Coleman, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the evangelist, uh, not the evangelist, but the uh, missionary who's in Africa. Uh, she's, uh, she's not doing very well physically, so let's remember Sister Coleman. Oh, no. well. well, we want to keep her in special prayers because she's got a lot of responsibility and as far as the wheels of God she's a big wheel in my opinion it's something that we can't even begin to understand what she does so she's a special one we want to pray for her uh, the Hatfields may I heard may I may not have heard anymore I haven't heard anymore. Um, they come in and they're friends. He's better safe. I'm we'll pray for them. Is he? He's better safe. Pastor Hatfield is better safe. I'm sorry, Joe. Can you speak up? Pastor Hatfield is very sick. I got the word last night. Yes. Okay. I'm going to pray for him and our pastors as they serve God and our leaders. As they serve God. You know, we don't know what they battle and how they battle behind closed doors and trying to keep this place running. You know. And spiritual battles, something we never understand. I want to pray for my men of God always. Keep them covered. 
Yeah, that's do definitely it's warm. Do they they get covered with kind of spiritual strength. Yes, Dean. Uh, I'm going to pray for DJ and all the other men that have left recently as well. Yes, the ones that have left us there. Let's pray for the ledgers too. Amen. Brother and Sister Ledger, Heavenly Mercies. Uh, our ministers here, Reverend Jerome, Reverend Wooten, and Reverend yes. Ledger. Sister Ledger, she's such, such a sweetheart. <coughs> I want to pray for those who can't come. Rhonda, Dave, Doug, the Blacks, the Vaughns, Judd, um, any others that come. Let's pray that even new ones and more come. Uh, when we get out of this, you guys don't be embarrassed to invite somebody to church. I invite people all the time. I haven't seen one guy show up so far. Um, other prayers, requests, testimonies? Yes, Joe. I have a special petition in my heart that um, <coughs> that the men that are here, that have come here, that have been here many years and many times, when we leave or when you want to leave, I pray that they find what they came here looking for. I pray when they leave, they really find what they came here to get and step out of these gates with that which they came to get. And if they don't have it, find it. Life yes. is too precious and fragile. You understand what I'm saying? It, a big thing about some changes that happened to me when I got here was just how a little kind word or just letting people know you believe in God and being able to talk to people. You see when people come in when they would first come and then you would see God work on their heart and then you would see them develop. You know, I mean, you're not involved in it, but it's like going on right in front of you, and you can actually see God working on people and changing people. And I pray that those changes stay in the, in people's hearts there. Uh, but that's all God's power. None of us here can take somebody's hand and walk up the stairway to heaven. I'll tell you what, though, you can take somebody's hand here and walk them straight to hell. You can support them in their beliefs or their fears, uh, loaning them drugs. I know that goes on here. You guys think I don't know about that? I do know about that. Um, shouldn't give people things, especially like when the reverends say don't give them cigarettes. Shouldn't give them cigarettes. You guys know what I'm talking about, and I'm not saying I'm not above you I just don't do it but I only got two eyes there's eyes all over here there's ears all over here you know why where do you get out of that that's not a good thing try and help people try and if especially if they want to quit smoking if they said I want to quit smoking I'm gonna quit smoking they prayed and they come to the altar to quit smoking and then they get weak. The devil gets into their heart and they ask you for a cigarette. You just pull it out and say, yeah, here. You're grabbing their hand and you're walking them down. Say no. It's just like that thing you see. Just say no. Doesn't matter. Let them go find somebody else. Get it off of you. And smoking, I'm not going to say anything one way or the other. Because uh, I smoked for 26 years, but I asked, and I got a prayer answered, and he just took care of that for me. Guys, just pray. It doesn't matter whether it's that or anything, whether it's porn that you're watching on the phone, or hate that you're spewing out at your family, or fear of child support making that payment. Maybe you're not going and getting a job because you're afraid of paying it. God, if you just take it and do it, God takes care of it. And he'll make what you do get, he'll take care of it all the way through. What little you can get, he can change that into more. And you always want to remember to give to God because the ministry is important and that's what we're going to do right now. Oh, we didn't need to say a prayer. <laughs>
God, please uh, listen to all of our prayers. I know that we stand for prayer. Lord God, hear our prayers, hear our cries. Lord Jesus, calm our fears. Help us with the things that we want to take out of our lives that are separating us from God. You should be number one in our hopes in our dreams, in our lives, because that makes you number one in our universe and in our souls, and we'll be able to follow you. We all want to make it to heaven, and it gets kind of difficult to imagine a life after this and after life, but I, I know that it's going to be there, and it's going to be beyond my wildest dreams, and I depend on that. And this world, because of knowing that that is so beautiful and wonderful and such a perfect thing for us because it's designed for us, makes it easy and simple and plain to live in the life that we're living here. Thank you so much for protecting us, putting roofs over our heads, clothes on our backs, food in our stomach, giving us good fellowship when we open our ears and our hearts to listen to it. Thank you for giving us the strength to overcome the things that tempt us. Thank you for giving us the power to understand the difference between good and bad and for installing a moral compass in each of our hearts because it's designed by you. We were designed by you, for you, and to worship you. I want to thank you for all the blessings and gifts that you've bestowed upon us here at the mission and watch over those that are not with us and those that are ill with the COVID our friends, our family, our finances, our supporters of the mission, our ministers and reverends that we have here, our department managers like Bob Kaepernick and like Stephen Short and like Daniel and maintenance and uh, Rodney who's taking care of our grounds. Thank you for the blessing of having Rodney. He does such a wonderful job. I personally see how hard he works and I just thank you for the inspiration of seeing him going and going and going like an ever ready bunny. Watch over all of the men that are here in the mission and lead us unto your desire, your choice in tiny steps or big steps. We humbly bow and put our face on the ground because you're blinding, Lord. Your power and your might is so great. There's a reason in the Bible that they say people collapse on the ground and cover their face. It's because of your brilliance, because you are light. You are our God. Jesus Christ, thank you for helping us and hearing our prayers. And Holy Spirit, move among us, sweep with a mighty hand, revive those in us of the things that we remembered and the truth that we want in our heart, and protect us. Change us, O oh Lord, because we can become better if we just listen. Please bless our ministry this morning and our teaching by Reverend Wooten. Bless our music and bless us. Please, Lord, we love you. We praise you. You are our God forever and ever. Amen. 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 Sorry about the long prayer. Sometimes they just spew out that way. Stephen. Dear Lord, thank you once again for bringing us all here. I, I just don't know how to thank you. Just, just sometimes I just don't know how. But we all, we all thank you and, and just ask you to bless us all today in, in some way. We all know you're here, uh, but sometimes we, we just need that little touch and just to let you know, let us know that you're there. Uh, I, I pray for that for each and every one of us today. I pray that you that you help Brother Wooten as he brings the message today, and and just thank you again for everything in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.
God forever. That was a good offering. You guys are good givers. Thank you so much. Steve. Okay, let's turn to page 606. No. Is that right? No, that's not right. No, what number have you got? 381. Th 381? Yeah, that's what you have on my list. Yeah, 381. <laughs> I had last week's in here too. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that we're all made out of light? Greatly slowed down. It, slow, it slows light down, and when we slow it down, it becomes matter. And that's what we're made out of, and that's what God is made of. True, true God. So, and that's a fact. You guys can look that up. Uh, it's a miracle. They don't understand it. Talk to me sometime, ask me about how that chain of events comes, and I'll let you know, because it's just proof right there that there is a God, and he's made out of light. The Bible says so, and 
He used a little bit of that light to make each one of us. So there's God in each and every one of us. Okay, just praise the Lord this morning, and let's listen to the wonderful lesson that we're about to receive. Reverend Wooten. Well, good morning again. Good morning. I hate to tell you that. Everybody else has told you that, but uh, we appreciate the Lord this morning. A beautiful, beautiful day. God's given us to worship, to look to Him, to lift our hearts in praise and adoration. This morning we want to look in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2. I love that. First Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Father, we thank you again this morning for reading of your word where we realize the significance of what you've done for us, how you reached down to lost humanity and brought us to a holy God. And we pray this morning, thou shalt help us, dear Lord, as we try our best to preach what you've given to us. Let our men be receptive to the preaching of thy word. Let them undertake, dear Father, to grasp it and to hold on to it, Lord. We pray that thy word will become living Within them, we ask you to help us again this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'd like to speak to us this morning on the significance of the cross, the cross of Jesus. When you look at the history of the cross, a lot of us tend to think that it started there at Calvary, but it started before that. The cross, the Christian cross, as a Christian symbol, has its roots in ancient paganism. Now, I was surprised to hear some of that, but the use of the Christian cross as a Christian symbol didn't begin until after the time of Constantine. The crucifixion and the death of Jesus on the cross conferred a new significance to the use of the cross in Christianity. And after Constantine, then the symbol or the use of the cross was acknowledged as a symbol of Christianity. Then they could wear it out openly and let people see who they really were. Vast body of evidence shows us that the cross was used centuries before the birth of Christianity. The cross is thought to have originated from the ancient Babylonians before it spread to other parts of the world, such as Syria, Egypt, Greek, Latin, India, and Mexico. The pre-Christian cross was used as a religious symbol and as an ornament among the Egyptians. Syrians, Greeks, Persians, Europeans, and in some parts of Africa, there was therefore universal use of the pre-Christian cross. In many cases, its use was usually connected to some form of devil worship. The pre-Christian cross existed in two forms. One was the Tau cross, or, and the other was the Svastika, or Filfoot cross. The Tos cross resembles the Greek symbol for the letter capital T, which is this way. We're probably more familiar with that one. 
On the other hand, the fivefold cross re resembles the four Greek capital letter G's placed together, which is the symbol of the swastika that you see from Germany. The Tau cross was initially used among the pagans, and it was later adopted by the Christians in Egypt, where its use became common. For this reason, the Tau cross is sometimes referred to as the Egyptian cross. Wow. Did you know that? Some of those things? How we see that those things that were used for evil brought about the salvation that we know today. Amen. But the cross, that's what I want to look at this morning, the cross of Jesus, the significance of it. There's four things that we want to look at this morning in reference to the cross of Jesus and its significance. We find this morning that, number one, the cross of Jesus is the revelation of God's judgment on sin. We would not know how sinful sin was if we did not have a Savior, if, we, if there was no cross. The evilness of the cross that I gave to you, its history here, has become the subject of God being able to use that to help us to realize the judgment that's placed on sin. Amen. The cross was a superb, superb triumph in which the foundations of hell were shaken. We see in Matthew chapter 16 that Jesus saith unto his disciples, Whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Blessed art thou, I mean, excuse me, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, what is this rock? That thou art the Christ, the Son of the God. He's talking about himself. That's the rock. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Praise God forever. Yes, man, right. Come on, man. The cross was a superb triumph in which the foundation of hell was shaken. Jesus marched into the presence of the very enemy of mankind and the very enemy of God that shaken his fist time after time in God's face. He marched into hell and snatched the keys away from him of death, hell, praise God, and the grave, and came out triumphant. Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful thought for us this morning when we think about the significance of the cross. Through the cross of Christ, he switched the whole of the human race back into a right relationship with God. We were messed up. As a nation, as a people, as a, in, as a creation of God, we were a messed up something when we came to a point in place where Adam and Eve sinned and brought sin down upon every one of us as a result of it. And at, since then, that time, men have sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned. And as it were, withstood the very things that God has brought across their path to bring them to a place of salvation. And they come face to face with the cross of Christ and still reject it. But we find the cross switched the whole of human race back into a right relationship with God. It was a skewed, friends. Thinking of man was only of himself. Let's lift me up. I will, I'll do what I think is right in my own my eyes. The humanistic thinking of their day and time. The humanistic thinking of our day and time. And we find this morning that through the cross of Christ, those things were righted. Praise God forever. The second thing, the cross did not just happen but we find that Christ came on a purpose for it. Did you hear what I said? Amen. It didn't just happen, but Christ came for that reason. Right. Yes. The whole meaning of the incarnation, which is the birth of Christ, was for the cross. 
we find in Ephesians chapter 3, 9 through 12. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Men tried their best to figure out the mystery which from the beginning in the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Christ Jesus to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God that we can understand what God is trying to get across to us according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. We have confidence by Jesus Christ to approach the throne of God and ask for salvation, ask to be saved, repent of our sins, and come to him seeking salvation. Why? Because today is the day, not tomorrow, not yesterday. Today is the day of salvation for us. And so we see that the cross didn't just happen. It wasn't something that just took place. It just sprang up because Jesus had made the religious rulers mad in his day and time. And because he spoke against their wickedness. And because he spoke against their distorted means of the word of God. The oracles that God had given to them. They had spoken evil against those things and twisted and perverted them. So that they would be to the satisfaction of their own minds and their own hearts. And we find that it didn't just happen because he made certain folks mad. But Jesus came on purpose for that reason, was to die on the cross. And yet, we take it for granted. In our generation, we take it for granted. The cross is the center of time and eternity the answer to the enigmas of both. Let me tell you something this morning. When we look at the calendar and we trace it back, it goes back to the time of Christ's birth. That's the Gregorian calendar that set it up on the Christian atmosphere that the whole world might be able to see. It went from that point forward to where we are today. It went from that point backward to where it showed the history of the world and the things that took place back there. And we recognize it as B.C. and A.D., before Christ. And Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, praise God forever. But you see, in 1700, there were some Jewish academies that decided they didn't like that. And so they set up the B.C.E. before Common Era and the C.E. Common Era. And it's only really taken off and become the most popular in the 1980s. You see, it's the devil's business, I think, to try to erase Jesus Christ from this world. He's tried it through every means that can be thought of. Down through the history of the church, we see where there have been those evil men that have arisen and stood against it and tried their best to burn it, tried their best to destroy it, tried their best to get rid of it, tried their best to do everything they could to obliterate it. But let me tell you something, friends. This morning, he still stands as King of kings and Lord of lords. He still stands as the Lord of glory. Praise God forever. And he stands as a center of time and eternity. Praise God forever. You might think when I get beyond this world and I'm in the next one, I won't have to hear this stuff. I won't have to know about it. But I believe, friends, that you make your entrance into hell, you're going to hear some sermons that you sat under that you could have responded to and you didn't. You'll hear those words again and again and again and again. They'll torment you, I believe. Morning, friends. Let me tell you something. We find that Jesus Christ is the center of history. He's the center of time. He's the center of eternity. Praise God forever. Hallelujah. And yet we can sit so passively when we talk about the cross, when we preach about the cross, when we hear about the cross. It holds no meaning for us today unless we wear it around our neck or we have it on some beads where we could finger it.
The cross of Jesus is not the cross of man, but the cross of God. And the cross can never be realized by mere, mere human experience. You can't come to the place where you could save yourself. If you could lift yourself up by your own bootstraps, you certainly would do it. But there's not a one of you that can levitate with both feet off the ground at the same time without coming back quickly. Hmm? And if you don't think that's true, you try it when you get back to the dorm. You try to lift both feet off the ground at once without holding on to something else and see if you can do it. And then you come back and tell us tonight in your testimony. Will you do that? Hmm? Because there won't be any testimonies, that's for sure. The cross is not something that I can create. It's not something that you can have as an imagination. It's not something you can build up in your mind. Friends, this is where Jesus Christ died on the cross. For what purpose? To save us, to redeem us, to bring us back from what we lost from. The cross was an awful price that had to be paid, and no mere man could pay that price, friends. Sacrifice had been given as an example in the Old Testament. There were times and times and times when people would offer sacrifice. They would give a sacrifice once a year, Yom Kippur. They would go to the, to the high priest and they'd bring their calf or they'd bring their sheep or they'd bring their turtle doves or they'd bring their goat. They'd bring something that they might be able to offer sacrifice unto Almighty God. For what purpose? For the cleansing of their heart, the cleansing of their sin nature. And it didn't happen, friends. They had to do it again and again and again and again. The cross is not of man, but it's the cross of Christ. Praise God forever. It is the exhibition of the nature of God whereby we can enter into that union with him. In Ephesians chapter 2, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we're dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. God's provided a divine gift. And he offers it to you. He offers it to me through Jesus Christ. On the cross, the sacrifice had to be. And the sacrifice was. And the sacrifice always will be. It's because it is Jesus Christ who was and is and always will be. But Jesus has offered us his self as a gift to me and to you. And yet we reject it. We reject it. Well, I'm not, I'm not ready today. When will you be? Tomorrow? Next week? Next month? When you leave the mission? Maybe just before you leave the mission so that you'll be able to have a little bit of help when you get out there. You can pray and ask Jesus to help you when you get in emergency situations. So when will it be? Maybe when you get old, some of you are there now. Maybe when you get in a rocket chair, you haven't got one yet. Maybe when you get down on your deathbed, maybe you won't have one. Amen. When will it be? Some of you, when will it be? You sit here and you listen and you listen and you listen and yet you continually push off. Oh, I listen, preacher. Yes, but you're not doing anything about it. You're not doing anything about the sin situation in your life. Why? Because you've embraced it. You love it. You enjoy it. You want it more than you do salvation. 
But you see, God has offered to me and you the gift of Jesus Christ. He's offered us the plan of redemption. He's offered to us salvation so we can have our sins washed away and our hearts made clean. Amen. And we still refuse. And we still don't walk that way. The cross of Jesus Christ is the very center, the very center of the plan of salvation. The reason it is so easy to obtain salvation is because it costs God so much. But it's that gift to me and to you. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 through 21, Paul said, For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. The reason it's so easy to obtain salvation is because it costs God so much. Amen. You ever stopped and realized that God was willing to step out of the realm of glory? Somewhere in eternal, in, in, in our eternity, our, our time schedule, stepped out of there into our time schedule and gave himself to a lost and dying world. And then, because of his love and because of his plan that he had for us, he prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. If this cup can pass from me, let it be so. But he was willing. He was willing to go to the cross for me and for you. He was willing to die for our lost and dying people. And we see this morning that that plan still is in place for me and for you. It hasn't been erased. It hasn't been shuttered off to the side. It hasn't been covered up and hidden. But it's still open for me and for you. It's still there. We still have a place where we can come and seek a holy God. He can help us to come to that place of realizing that it cost him great. But all you have to do is give of you and say, I'm sorry for the things I've done. It is the point where God and sinful man merge with a crash and the way of eternal life is open for us. Romans chapter 3 says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and to all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all, all, A-L-L, -L, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. In His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, not present, not future, but those sins that you have committed. And any preacher that preaches the future forgiveness of sins that haven't been committed is preaching false doctrine. There's no sin that can be forgiven if it hasn't been committed. And it would be presumptuous on our part if we said, Lord, forgive me because I'm going to go out and drink. Lord, forgive me because I'm going to go out and get me a woman. Lord, forgive me because I'm going to take some dope. Lord, forgive me because I'm going to steal. Lord, forgive me because I'm going to kill somebody. Lord, forgive me because I have revenge. Lord, forgive me. Does that work? No. It says, for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his 
righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So you see, the significance of the cross is important. Not just any cross, but the cross of Jesus. Guy Penrod wrote the song, "'Twas a life filled with aimless desperation. Without hope walked the shell of a man, then a hand with a nail print stretched downward. Just one touch, then a new life began. And the old rugged cross made the difference. Did you hear me? The old rugged cross made the difference. In a life bound for heartache and defeat, I will praise him forever and forever. For the cross made the difference for me. Has it made a difference for you? If not, friends, it can. If not, it can. And here's where it needs to be met. Whether here at this altar or whether out in the yard or at your bed, in your car, wherever you might be, and you make your altar, that's where you can find Jesus Christ. Because the old rugged cross is what makes the difference. Not anything else you can do, friends. Not any money you can give. Not any people you can offer. Not your life, your fame, your every, not anything, friends. Only you can come to him and repent of your sins at the foot of the cross. And the blood, the blood that was sprinkled, praise God forever, will wash away every sin stain and make you white as snow. If you haven't experienced that, then you can't stand and testify that you're saved. Friends, time is short. We're closer to eternity than we've ever been this morning. You're closer to eternity than you've ever ever been. And some of you may be closer than I am, and I may be closer than some of you. But friends, we need to make sure that the cross has a place in our Christian life. Let's stand for prayer. If you haven't come to the foot of the cross, you can come this morning. I know it's late, but that's okay. The cooks won't go until I tell them. And I'd rather take a few extra minutes to wait for you to come to an altar prayer than for you to stay out there and for you to come to eternity and stand before God so he could have given me just a few minutes to make up my mind whether I wanted to pray or not. And I didn't do it because he didn't give me another few minutes. What about a friend this morning? Don't, don't try to fool yourself. Well, I'm not going down to the altar. I, I'm not going to go down there and pray. I'm not going to show people where I am or what I am or who I am or what's going on in my life. I'm not going to do that. But friends, you may wish there'd be a time somewhere out there standing before God's judgment that you wish you had of. The cross, the cross, friends, is what we need to look at this morning. The cross is what you need to embrace. The cross is where you need to come to the foot of and kneel. What will you do this morning? Please don't reject and turn aside. I know when you get out of the smoke pit, you're going to chew me up and spit me out, but that's okay, friends. You may do that because we preachers may not be the greatest in the world, and we may not be known as some, but I can tell you one thing, God's word is sure and steadfast. It's sure and steadfast, friends. And it doesn't change because of you or because of me. It's there. And what will you do with it?
What will you do with it? Father, as we bow before you this morning, we pray, Lord Jesus, that thou shalt help us. Father, I pray make every sinner in this chapel this morning so under conviction they can't eat or sleep or rest or walk or enjoy life, Lord. They just feel so uncomfortable in a sinful heart, a sinful life, and recognize, Lord, they are living before a holy God. I pray, dear Lord, bring wrath down upon those, dear Father, who refuse unbelief, no desire, dear Lord, draw back disbelief. I pray this morning that you would help. Stir this mission, dear Jesus, down to the depths and bring us a mighty revival because we see the cross of Jesus and where it's placed in our life and in our heart, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's gather in and pray for Jason. Lord, we're glad to see his heart, dear Lord. We pray this morning.